All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, this is session three of our Cybersecurity Essentials for Business Users. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jesse Hill. I'm the president at Tier 3 IT. And I'm just going to walk you through um, this uh, is uh, one of a series of sessions that we're doing to help just educate um, our clients and you know, the people that we come in contact with um, so they understand more about cybersecurity and how we can all work together to improve um, you know, the posture of each of our businesses. So we like to start um, all of our presentations um, and just talk really quickly about our brand commitment, which is up on the screen here. This is essentially our promise to our clients and what we believe makes us unique um, in how we approach you know, the world of IT. You'll notice that it's uh, you know, very heavily focused on connecting with people and understanding your business so that you can improve efficiency and profitability. And I mean, at the end of the day, to us, technology is a tool to help you achieve business goals and overcome business challenges. Um, there's no other reason to be investing in technology other than to improve those things. For a little bit of background into the, uh, I guess, the mindsets or the frameworks that we talk about around cybersecurity, there's two in particular that we that we um, are going to talk about. One is the NIST cybersecurity framework, and really we're looking at these you know colored boxes over on the right hand side here. There's five categories: identify and protect are considered to be proactive activities, respond and recover are reactive activities, and the one in the middle, detect, determines whether we are being proactive or reactive. Meaning if we are using the detect column to find areas of weakness to improve our protection, that's proactive. If detect is telling us that there's a breach or an attack that has occurred, then we are over to the right and respond and recover. You'll see these, um, these labels in the um, controls that we're gonna be talking about. The second um, model that gets layered into here is called the CIS controls. And the CIS controls, it's a set of um, 18 groupings of um, security best practices that encompass 153 different um, safeguards. Now, it's very overwhelming when you start thinking about, oh, I have to do 153 different things to protect my network. So what they've done is they've taken and broken those into what they call implementation groups. So implementation group one is about your basic cyber hygiene. It encompasses 56 of those safeguards. If you are a little bit more um, technologically mature, we'll call it, you may be um, ready to add the 74 items from implementation group two. Now, the important thing to know about these is that each group builds on, on the previous. So if you were considered um, that your business, you're, you're in implementation group two, you would have all of the items in implementation group one done, and then two. And then of course, the highly sophisticated um, organizations would be in group three. Last session, we went through the first four of the CIS controls. So today we're gonna to start on, on number five, um, being account management. So we can see that this one has a total of six safeguards and four of them are in implementation group one and the other two are in group two and three. And really what this is about is about making sure that um, only the right people have access to the data, the systems, the software, the services that are you know, encompassed by your technology. Um, this is a, a, a critical component because um, when it comes down to it, a, a large number of you know, breaches and attacks, they happen because somebody has gained access to an administrative level account or an account that has higher permissions than they have. Um, this can be something as simple as making sure that folders are locked down um, by security groups. Um, it's about making sure that we're turning off old accounts when people no longer work with us, you know, all of those types of things. So the six safeguards in here, 
um, we can see them over on the right here. And again, um, we see, you know, 5.1 is to establish and maintain an inventory of accounts. We see the blue box here for identify, telling us that this is a proactive um, activity on the NIST cyber framework. And it has the three dots, you know, green, orange, and blue, um, because this is in all three of the implementation groups. So we see the first one, an inventory of accounts is making sure that we know who should have access to our systems. Using unique passwords, um, this is a big one. And I think it's something that is often, you know, um, trivialized or, or looked past. But as business leaders, we really need to work with our people to make sure that they understand that every single site or service that they log into should have a unique, a long, a complex password. Um, so many attacks happen because somebody has, has scraped um, usernames and passwords off of one service. So maybe they, um, you know, one of these big breaches like the um, um, Yahoo or Ashley Madison or something like that, and they steal 100,000 or a million or 10 million usernames and passwords. Well, a certain percentage of those passwords are going to work on other sites. So if you, if you or your staff are used to using the same username and password for multiple sites, you're putting yourself at risk. 5.3 is disabling dormant accounts. Um, and I mean, this is uh, unfortunately common where people, maybe they go on a, on a sick leave or you know, a maternity leave and the business says, you know what, we're just going to leave their account because they'll be coming back in a couple months. Well, then they never come back. There needs to be a process to identify which accounts are not being used and to disable them, you know, to make sure that they don't get, um, you know, um, attacked. Restricting admin administrator privileges. So this one here, again, super important because when we think about the way that most attacks happen, they happen because they are given permission on, on the system at a higher level than they should. So those are all the four that are out of implementation group one. We can see that the, the last two are again, you know, more about inventory, more about um, central, centrally managing them. And those are implementation group two. All right, access control management. So this is um, to tie off with what we just talked about, which is once you have accounts set up, then you need to give levels of permission or privilege um, to you know, people on your network. We can see down here, um, you know, talking about uh, making sure that um, like these are these are done um, kind of in in concert with each other, and enforcing strong authentication is part of this. So strong authentication um, is those long passwords that we talked about. Um, we see on here when we start getting through down to you know some of the later ones, we see MFA on here standing for multi-factor authentication. Um, and this is becoming a, a security standard. You know, our internal you know, policy is any site or service that we use that has multi-factor authentication, we have to enforce it, turn it on and use it. And, and quite frankly, we um, sometimes make decisions about not using a service if it doesn't have the appropriate controls. So in our implementation group one, um, you know, the first one, you, you'll notice a bunch of these are about having processes in place. So the first two are about how do we grant pros, how do we grant access and how do we revoke um, access? So in our world, um, every single one of our clients, when we go into their contact list, only certain people are permitted to make changes. And the reason that we do this is specifically for this so that we don't, you know, inadvertently or accidentally allow somebody to make changes to someone else's permissions. Three, four, and five, right? We talk about multi-factor authentication. So um, externally exposed applications is web-based services. It's software that you're hosting you know, on a local server that is accessible um, from the outside world. 
So a good example is, you know, your Microsoft 365 or QuickBooks Online. Um, a lot of these services have multi-factor options available, but unfortunately they're not all enforced as a standard. And so sometimes you have to go and you have to click through a couple of things to turn that on. Um, if you're considering enabling multi-factor authentication, we absolutely recommend, you know, look at anything that has a financial implication. So banking, accounting, payroll, um, you know, those types of things. Communications and, and client information, um, you know, so Office 365, um, you know, your CRM, your, if you were in the medical field, um, you know, anything where you've, you've got personally identifiable information. If one of those key services that you use does not have a multi-factor option, submit a ticket with them. Ask them, when is this being added? Um, because in today's day and age, everything, um, you know, especially web-based should have an option for that. 6.4 um, is remote network access. So this is about enforcing multi-factor authentication on those VPN connections or those external connections into the network. Um, we have a, a um, Sophos has just released an update that's going to simplify um, this whole process. We're going to be rolling that out for all of our clients um, over the coming quarter. And so you'll start seeing when you go to log in, you know, one more place where you're going to have an added level of security. 6.5, this one is actually um, a challenging one to implement because it's, it's saying require multi-factor for administrative access. The reality is, is that not every on-premise solution has that built in. Multi-factor multi -factor has primarily been a web application solution. Um, and so this is a, a best efforts kind of implementation on this one. And then the 6.6, uh, again, having an inventory of authentication and authorization systems. So you don't want a whole bunch of people using a whole bunch of different platforms because you can't control that. So as much as possible, we wanna look at leveraging some of those tools like, like Microsoft 365 for single sign on and Azure Active Directory. Um, that one again is gonna be specific to each individual organization and what's available and what makes sense for them. Seven and eight, um, again, those are implementation groups two and three, um, and it's um, very enterprise level um, types of solutions, uh, again, your, your platforms have to support those. Control number seven, continuous vulnerability management. The threats that, were, that faced our networks yesterday are not the same threats that we're going to face tomorrow. So, um, you know, at Christmas time, uh, you know, the, the IT world was all abuzz because they discovered a new threat in the Apache web servers. Well, once they know about that, there will be patches that are released that need to be applied. In order to apply those patches, we need to be able to find those areas that have a vulnerability. And so if we don't have the proper tools in place to be able to find systems that might be vulnerable, how are we ever going to patch them? So this um, control is all about making sure that we have a way to detect, um, to identify, to patch and um, you know, solve those vulnerabilities. So we can see, again, you know, it starts off talking about having a, a process and a, a vulnerability management process, um, a remediation process. And, and these two, um, you know, they go hand in hand because we need to be able to search the networks, um, find all of the places that, that those threats may be you know, exposed, assess the level of risk, um, and then we can move into you know, three and four, which is about deploying patches. So 7.3 is about operating systems, making sure that when Microsoft releases um, their their patches, their security updates, that we have a process to deploy them across all of our systems. Now, one thing it doesn't talk about in this one is about having a, 
um, a review process for your patching. Um, and this is really important to, to us in particular because unfortunately, Microsoft and every software vendor, every year there's a couple of patches that come out that cause more problems than they solve. And so for us in our process, everything that gets released goes through a review process, which largely is sitting and waiting for a couple of days and letting the rest of the world test it. Um, but we also have a way of, of approving which patches are gonna be pushed out and then making sure that they go out you know, in those scheduled windows. So that's 7.3. 7.4 is specifically around application patch management. So this is a lot trickier than it sounds because when you consider the typical you know, network, let's say there's 20 computers. We know that we have a server, we have 20 computers, they're 96% of them are all gonna be running some version of Microsoft Windows. But across those 20 computers, there might be 300 applications because we have different versions of Acrobat Reader and Excel and Word and QuickBooks and Sage and you know the list goes on and on and on. And so in order to do this, it goes back to one of the earlier ones about having an inventory of approved applications. And we wanna focus on, on those ones that either have known risks or that have um, you know, uh, a security um, upgrade that's available to them. They need to be deployed in a way that doesn't interrupt you know, the, the users. And so 7.4, a little bit tricky, um, but getting better all the time of, of how we can manage those things. Um, 7.7, you'll notice it's it's in implementation group. It's got the dot for implementation group one, um, but it is strictly a, a, a reactive or a responsive um, function uh, when a vulnerability has actually occurred. Audit log management. Uh, <laughs> when I was flipping through these, I, I was like, Moe, this one is real exciting. <laughs> uh, we'll notice here that this is one of the, the ones that the large majority of these are not occurring in implementation group one. We'll see the, the highlight here is about collecting, a, you know, reviewing, alerting, and retaining logs. The reason that this is going to be in implementation, primarily in implementations group two and three, is again, when we talk about that 20 device network, there are a lot of logs. There are system logs, security logs, application logs, you know, backups, firewalls, um, you know, network logs, millions and millions of entries. And, and the challenge is to find those pieces of information that are relevant and that will help us either identify a risk or mitigate a risk or recover you know, from something. So in implementation group one, you know, it talks about establishing and maintaining an audit log management process. Two is collecting those. And three is in ensuring you have adequate storage. Now, the thing that I find interesting when we look at these three is that in implementation group one, it doesn't say that we need to have a process to review all of these logs or to alert off of them. It's really just about saying, collect them. This is not information that typically is going to direct activity unless it's generating an error log or you know, something along those lines. So again, we have systems and tools and processes in place um, that are designed to do these. And it's one of the areas that I think that we're making you know, a, a pretty significant stride um, in this quarter is really refining which logs we're collecting and specifically what we're looking for in them that might be unusual that would help us, um, again, you know, plan activities or respond you know, before something becomes uh, an issue. I'm not gonna go through all of the, the individual items on this one because quite frankly, it's, it's just a lot of the same things about collecting and centralizing and retaining of logs. Email and web browser protections. 
this one is um, recognizing that we give these tools to our employees and we allow outside things to come into our network. So when you think about you know uh, a web page, every time I log on to my onto my web browser and I type in you know tier three it.ca and I hit enter, I have requested all of the content from that web page to come to my browser and to execute. Um, same thing when I open an email attach an email if it has an attachment or a link that I click on, I'm inviting that onto my computer. And this is where a large majority of the threats that, that enter you know, businesses come from. And it's, there's, two, there's, there's parts to this. I mean, there's a part of it that is a te technology solution about locking down um, what you have access to. But then there's also you know, components about user awareness and, and training and those types of things. So 9.1. Ensure use of only fully supported browsers and email clients. So when we're looking at something like this and it says fully supported, what that, it can mean a number of different things, um, but it typically means that we need to be running a current web browser that has you know, ongoing maintenance and support and security patches that are being uh, um, you know, deployed for them. So we don't want to see a 15-year-old web browser that's allowing all of the different um, extensions running on them. Where we see this going in the future, um, one of our security initiatives uh, for later this year is to actually standardize which web browser our staff you know, are permitted to use. Um, again, it sounds simple, but it's actually fairly complex um, to lock that down. And the reason that it's important is that as we, as we go down this path, we're going to be able to restrict um, not just the browsers, but hopefully which plugins and extensions um, they're using in there as well. 9.2, a DNS filtering service. Um, another way of saying this is that we want to restrict access to you know, certain types of web content. So known malicious websites, um, you know, websites that are not, you know, safe for the workplace, um, you know, any of those types of services that when, when we think about computers as a tool to do a job, would we want to introduce that kind of risk into the network? So this one right now, uh, fairly simple on, on one and two. Um, as we move down the line here, we start seeing, um, you know, more filtering on the URLs, um, blocking um, different types of extensions. Um, so that's what I mentioned earlier about, you know, when we get there, we'd like to standardize on certain browsers, block those. Um, implementing DMARC. So this is a, um, a you know, a very specific, um, I guess, policy or configuration on your, um, on your domain that is designed to help reduce the chances of spoofing. Um, and it also improves the, I guess, the trust relationship that your domain has with the rest of the world and, and just makes it so that it's, it's harder for people to pretend to be you, um, improves the deliver, deliverability of your emails. 9.6 is blocking unnecessary file types. Um, by and large, this is something that, that um, we have already accomplished for many of our clients using group policies, using you know, um, you know, the endpoint security solutions that we have. And you know, the last one, 9.7, is very specific because um, it, it specifically talks about protecting your email server, which the large majority of businesses do not um, host anymore. Malware defenses. Um, so seven items in this one. Uh, I think we all understand that malware is one of the single largest risks that you know, most sm small businesses face. Um, it can come by way of you know, an email attachment, uh, a malicious download, you know, somebody plugging in an infected USB stick. Um, and more and more, these are focused on ransomware, um, and one thing that we've seen in the last two weeks around the um, 
you know, everything that's going on overseas is that these groups that used to encrypt your data and, and hold you ransom for it, they're trying to destabilize um, more so these days. And we've actually seen them just shift to wiping data. Um, and the reason for that is, again, that it's a little bit more politically driven than um, profit driven, like we've seen in the past. So 10.1, having anti-malware software. So in our world, um, there are multiple layers of anti-malware. Um, you know, we have, you know, the traditional antivirus. And, and then in our case, we also deploy anti-ransomware solutions. Um, you're going to see other other things coming down the line where, um, you know, I think it ties in with the signature updates and, and filtering based on um, application hashes, if, if that's the right way to say it. But the idea being is that every time an antivirus solution finds a way to block a malicious file, the people who make the malicious files are, are finding ways to get around it. And it's a constant game of cat and mouse. 10.2, uh, configure automatic anti-malware signature updates. This just basically is saying, um, you know, we need to use a, an anti-malware application that is available to manage the updates. Many organizations, when they start out, they, they get what's free or what's cheap or what's easy. Um, and you don't get the centralized management to be able to control that. 10.3, um, disable auto run and auto play for removable media. This isn't as big of a concern as it, as it used to be when we used to move things around by, you know, DVDs or CDs and, and USB sticks quite frequently, but it's still relevant. Um, you know, when you plug a USB stick in, you don't want it to just automatically play whatever is on that. And the reason being is that if it's malicious and it executes, it can you know, cause problems for you. So then um, into implementation group two, we can see it fills out the rest of them, which is all about you know, locking down the system using you know, the, the anti-malware software that you have available. The way that I describe it often is that you know, when you get into, into the settings and implementation group two, your security is going to increase but your convenience will go down a little bit. You're going to have to make a couple extra clicks. You're going to have to scan some things before you open them. But big picture, it's going to help you to secure your, your systems and your network better than if you weren't doing it. Whew, all right. So we are close to the 3.30 timeline here. I'm going to stop the recording and we can answer any questions that anyone might have. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we will pick this up again next, no, two weeks from now.